Just give me the high sign, Larry. All right, welcome folks. Thank you for coming to this important community meeting and update on the 2018 community storm and uh, mudslide. I want to introduce Mayor Fred Shaw. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. This important meeting. Um, before we get started, kind of my job is the easy part. I'm going to thank all the people that are involved working on this crisis. This could take a few minutes. It's a whole lot of people. Um, I'd like to thank our first responders, our firefighters, sheriffs, <laughs> search and rescue, highway patrol, Cal Fire. Uh, and also all the other boots on the ground, like our uh, county flood control, who are even now cleaning out our flood control basins, and uh, Caltrans and our own water and sanitary district personnel and public works, who not only are helping us here in Carpinteria, but a lot of them are involved helping in Montecito as well. Um, and I don't want to forget all the folks that are kind of behind the scenes. Our emergency medical services, the Red Cross, County Mental Health Services, the County Office of Emergency Services, and our own certs here in town who have been directing some traffic, especially up at Baylord, and also our own city staff, Dave, Charlie, and Mimi, and all the rest of them who've been almost a 24-7 job over the last month. Um, also, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, recognize, and you've probably seen it, uh, Southern California Gas and uh, Edison are both uh, over there off Dump Road stage to work as soon as they can get into some of these areas. And Cox Cable, I know a lot of you are happy you've gotten it back. And, and those of you who haven't yet, you will. You will. They're working steadfastly to get it done. Also, just as a brief note, our elected officials have been doing a lot. I've been uh, in communication with them um, on the phone for the past week or so at a general meeting, and that includes Senator Feinstein, uh, Congressman Carbajal, State Senator Jackson, Assemblymember Lamone, um, Supervisors Hartman and uh, Doss Williams. And every one of them is bringing whatever they can respectively to bear on the crisis that we're facing right now and doing their best to get us through this and bring us back to a sense of normalcy here in Carpentria and on the South Coast. With that, I'll turn it back over to Dave and thank you again all for being here. Our host today is the Alcazar Theater. Thank you, Osa, and all the Alcazar folks that are a volunteer board and they're doing a great job. So today, and Larry, I forgot. Oh, and Larry Nimmer, who's filming it today. Thank you. So our meeting today, uh, we're going to talk about what happened early in the morning hours this past Tuesday when the storm hit, the preparations that occurred before the storm and their importance going forward, the impact of the storm on Carpinteria. Charlie's going to talk about some of those details the status of recovery efforts for utilities, roads, and flood control facilities that were impacted by the storm, planning and preparation work being done in anticipation of the possibility of more mud flows and flash floods in the weeks, months, and even years ahead. We also want to hear from you, so we'll have a period at the end for a question and answer, and I'll ask that you hold your questions uh, until then because uh, we want to provide plenty of time for that. We also got some questions uh, over the uh, internet uh, that Matt Organista handled for us. So when we get to that point, I think we'll go back and forth between, yay, Matt, yeah. We'll go back and forth between, um, uh, between the questions that we got over the internet and, and live questions. Um, this is a Carpinteria focused meeting, so we're going to have a, a, about a 10 minute video here in a couple of minutes uh, that uh, gives an overview of the incident uh, from, that uh, was prepared by Cal California Office of Emergency Services, Cal OES. Um, and then most of our talk is going to be focused today on what happened in Carpinteria, um, uh, how it un the storm unfolded in Carpinteria, and what that means going forward in terms of our work and planning, preparedness, and for all of you. Um, 
We also handed out a couple of things, uh, so uh, important information that we've been trying to put out there. We have daily updates that come out about noon on work going on here in Carpinteria, as well as the overall incident report that also comes out daily. Uh, we post those online and we provide them at the informational kiosks around town. This meeting's being uh, video recorded. Uh, it'll be uh, replayed on Government Access TV, Channel 21, Carpinteria's uh, public uh, government uh, television station. Um, probably beginning tomorrow at noon, we'll start replaying that. And Larry's also streaming live on Facebook, uh, on uh, Larry Nimmer's Facebook page. Uh, also, um, uh, this will be replayed Again, starting about noon tomorrow, it'll be archived and available on YouTube, the City of Carpentria's YouTube site. Um, uh, Joe Black is to my right here. Uh, she's our sign language interpreter. Thank you, Joe, for coming. And for Spanish language speakers, uh, if you uh, didn't meet Sonia Agu Aguila, uh, coming in, she has uh, she's interpreting uh, Spanish, and she has headphones for you if you prefer to uh, listen in that way. So thank you, Sonia, for coming. These are all volunteers, by the way. Our speakers today are Charlie Ebling, our public works director at the city of Carpinteria, Fire Chief uh, Ray Navarro from the Carpinteria Summerland Fire Protection District. Lieutenant Brian Olmstead from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department, and Carla Leal from Cox, who's going to give us an update what's going on with cable service. Um, with that, I think I'll go and we'll play the video, if we could start that from um, Cal OES, uh, that provides an overview of the incident. It was what some called apocalyptic. Oh my God, Mom! Although they knew it was coming, many people still got swept away. They were trapped and, 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 and unfortunately many people were killed. Hundreds of rescuers still searching for the missing. We have had a number of significant rescues and a number of rescues today. How did this happen? We've got answers from experts. And what you should be doing before the next storm hits. That's coming up on this edition of Inside Look. Hi, I'm Brian May in the State Operations Center at Cal OES headquarters where they are continuing to coordinate mutual aid efforts as hundreds of rescuers continue search and recovery efforts after the mudslides in the Santa Barbara area. Hundreds of first responders from all across the state continue to search for those still missing. Santa Barbara County officials on Wednesday said this is still very much a search and rescue operation. There are several factors that go into determining how long a victim will be viable and all of those factors including air temperature, soil temperature, weather conditions and the like will be evaluated before we move into the recovery mode. With still so many people missing, if you or a loved one are safe, you can let your family and friends know that you're safe and that can bring a great deal of peace of mind. You can register yourself safe and well on the American Red Cross website at safeandwellcommunityos.org. Here at the State Operations Center, they're coordinating over two dozen mutual aid teams from Swiftwater Urban Search and Rescue Teams to fire engine strike teams like what you would see at the fires. That's nearly 600 personnel deployed. And understand, the conditions that these search and rescue teams are in are among the toughest you can imagine. These guys are worn out. You know, they're doing long hours. They're not going to quit until every rescue has been performed. But one of the unique things about that mud is the weight and the amount of effort it takes to move through it. So it's not, you can't just dig a hole in the ground now to find somebody because that's all going to want to cave in on you. It's just taxing. It's, it's heavy. It's wet. It's everything everybody hates. It's, it's muddy, it's wet, it's heavy, it's long hours, it's cold, um, and it, it just exhausts the crews out there. In addition to the search and rescue efforts, there is also a massive cleanup effort taking place. That river that you see is actually Highway 101 in Santa Barbara County. This portion of 101 closed until early next week. Sean Boyd is in Santa Barbara with more. 
Yeah, we're here in Santa Barbara at the Highway 101 overpass of Olive Mill Road. I don't think you've ever seen Highway 101 that empty before. Maybe that dirty, maybe not. But let's take a look at the north side of this overpass. This is where the lowest point of the highway is. It's where everything is congregated, all the debris, the mud. But not only is the debris removal operation in full swing, it's also simultaneously a search and rescue mission. An excavator normally assigned to dig and remove material is now being mission tasked as a people mover. Members of the LA County Urban Search and Rescue Team are suiting up and climbing aboard the bucket at the end of this 60-foot arm to comb every inch of this half-mile stretch of Highway 101 looking for any signs of life. 72 hours into the massive mudslide that's devastated Montecito and Santa Barbara, there's still the possibility and hope that someone will be found alive. Meanwhile, heavy equipment is scooping, dumping, and scooping again. And again. In a concerted cycle, with the goal of removing every gallon of mud from Highway 101. There are some sections of the highway that were flooded up to two feet. It's an operation jointly coordinated by Cal OES and led by Caltrans, and time is of the essence. This is the lifeline between LA and the Central Coast. 95,000 vehicles a day use this section. Earlier, Cal OES Director Mark Gillarducci, along with Santa Barbara's Sheriff, National Guard, the CHP, and FEMA got an aerial and ground tour of the path of destruction. Right now, as we just we, we verified uh, uh, the need for uh, search and rescue personnel over the, the, the period of the next few days, and we also got a really good sense of the complexity of the debris clearance operation that's going to be required here. Those SAR teams conducted primary searches using specialized drone and helicopter flyovers, and those are now being supplemented by this. The dozer dump dance will continue day and night, with trucks often resembling planes lined up on the runway at LAX, waiting their turn to move ahead. Monday, January 15th is the goal they've now set to complete this enormous challenge. So we'll be out here 24-7 uh, with our operation to clean up this highway, and then we need to check for damage. Boy, the activity going on around town is incredible. The work that is going in to clean up the mud and get these roads open and safer travel is incredible. And not only do the people who live here and have been negatively impacted by these floods and mudslides love the firefighters, so do we here at Cal OES. Back to you. Sean, thanks. Search and rescue teams from across the state had searched about 75% of the affected area as of Thursday. The storms had claimed 17 lives, and officials fear that number could climb. That's why hundreds are still involved in the search and rescue operation. After touring the area by both ground and air, the director of Cal OES left with two key takeaways. People who get warnings to evacuate need to evacuate. There are cases where people did not evacuate, did not heed the warnings. They were trapped, and, 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 and unfortunately many people were killed. And, and the second thing is, is that uh, uh, these types of events, we don't see them that often here in California, uh, but um, they, they, they present a, a series of uh, challenges in being able to figure out how to get resources into an area that's completely covered in, in 5, 10, 15 feet of mud. So the question many of you may still have is, how did this happen? The wet weather that went through Southern California didn't seem bad enough to cause this much damage and destruction. With more on how this happened, here's Jonathan Goodell. We are here in the State Operations Center where coordinated efforts are ongoing in response to the Southern California storms. Up to five inches of rain fell in Santa Barbara County alone within the last 24 to 48 hours. And to talk more about the storms we brought in, Courtney Oberg fell from the National Weather Service and Courtney, this felt like just any other winter storm. What was significant about it and what was different this time? So it was like a normal winter storm in terms of amounts and coming off the ocean, but what was different this time is we had wildfire burn scars from this fall and winter, and we had a lot of very heavy rainfall that fell in a matter of hours causing the mudslides. So two terms we've heard a lot about in the last two days, 
mudslides and debris flow. What are some of the differences between the two of them? So a debris flow is basically just a bigger mudslide. So a mudslide, you get rain and water moving down a hill, bringing mud with it. A debris flow happens after a wildfire. And so there's nothing left to soak up the rain on the hillsides. So it can bring down trees, boulders, rocks, anything in its path. So it's still early in winter. What are some of the lessons learned? Maybe we've learned from this event and uh, also moving forward some tips. Well, people who live near burn areas, we advise them to be ready to evacuate in a minute's notice. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what you're taking with you? Do you know how to get in contact with your family? And also to heed those instructions from local officials should they ask you to evacuate. Absolutely, Courtney. Thank you for the advice. The rain has stopped for now, but there is still work to be done in the field and still a lot of work to be done here at the State Operations Center. Here's why areas that burn in wildfires can face such severe flood risk when it rains so soon afterwards. During a wildfire, the burning plants release gas, and that gas permeates into the soil, causing the roots to weaken. The gas then cools and solidifies, forming a wax-like layer at the surface. Unable to permeate the ground, the rain then begins to saturate and weaken the topsoil above that waxy layer. As more rain falls, chunks of topsoil break loose and slide down the slope. Rocks, trees, and mud flow freely and can exceed 35 miles an hour. Left behind, a thick, water-resistant layer that can last for years based on the intensity of the fire. As you heard earlier, even with the increased threat of debris flows and mudslides, some people did not heed evacuation warnings when the heavy rains began. We want to take this time to remind you, if you are in a burned area and you're advised to leave, do so. We try and use the strongest possible language we can to make people understand that they need to leave their homes, gather the valuables that they need, uh, paperwork, licenses, things of that nature that are irreplaceable, and then get out uh, uh, and, and recognize that your life and the lives of your family are more important than your properties. Again, please listen to and follow evacuation orders. If you are safe or a loved one safe after the mudslides, mark yourself safe on the Red Cross website. And if you'd like more information on a local level, you can go to the County of Santa Barbara's website. That's countyofsb.org. For all of us at Cal OES, I'm Brian May. Thanks for watching. Visit our online newsroom at oesnews.com to learn more about this program and get the latest news and information from our team. Don't miss our next video on your Facebook timeline. Like our page and you'll get the latest posts as they happen. If you're an Instagram user, you can see the latest snapshots by following our Cal OES Instagram account. And Twitter users can get instant access to our tweets from across the state by following Cal OES. All right, a couple of things to point out about that video. Um, if you notice their reference to uh, rain 24 to 40 hours ago, it's, it's a few days old now and things are already out of date. It's a dynamic situation. One of the things is just this morning, it went from a search and rescue operation to a search and recovery operation. Um, and also, uh, they mentioned the goal of opening the freeway by tomorrow, Monday, January 19th. That's not going to happen now. They've announced, in fact, that uh, they don't, do not have a date they can set for certain on when the freeway is going to be open. We'll talk about that in a little more detail uh, to come. But first, I want to give an overview of um, our situation here in Carpinteria. Um, this uh, map shows the uh, burn area uh, in the foothills of Carpinteria. You can see outlined in black here, this is the city of Carpinteria boundaries with the agricultural area in the unincorporated Santa Barbara County around the city, Rincon Point down here, the salt marsh over here. So this is as the, as the fire moved east to west across the foothills and then further into the back country in Santa Barbara, Toro Canyon. Um, that's the area in red you see. Whoops. <laughs> I got to the punchline too soon. All right. Um, so uh, this is the, these are, there's three watersheds in Carpinteria. Um, those watersheds are the Carpinteria uh, Creek watershed to the east, the Franklin Creek watershed, Santa Monica watershed that affect the city of Carpinteria. Just to the uh, west of us is the important Arroyo Paradon watershed. To the east of us is the Rincon watershed that goes down through the. Now, the Carpinteria Creek watershed you're familiar with. 
um, because it's a natural creek. You cross it, there's a lot of vegetation that's very noticeable through the city. The other creeks you may not be as familiar with because they're in concrete line channels, Franklin Creek uh, and Santa Monica Creek, which both outlet into the, into the salt marsh. Carpinteria Creek outlets through a lagoon through the state park. Um, you may be familiar with. So you can see the watershed in purple here is Carpinteria Creek uh, and the overlaid burn area. About 80% of that watershed burned in the Thomas Fire. The Franklin Cr Creek watershed, a smaller watershed in the foothills uh, between, lower foothills between Carpinteria watershed and Franklin, um, about 45% uh, of that watershed burned in the Thomas Fire and on the uh, adjacent Santa Monica Creek watershed, uh, about 83% of that watershed burned. And then Royal Paradon, uh, we estimate 36%. So these are our estimates that we made in-house takeoffs based on the watershed area and the outline of the burn area. So significant amounts of burn uh, prior to this storm. Um, these three watersheds, as I mentioned, uh, drain down through the city of Carpinteria by way of creeks and channels. And very importantly, um, there are debris basins that were built at the top of these watersheds. Now, Carpenter Creek at one, or Carpenteria area was at one time one of the most flood-prone areas in the region, certainly in the county of Santa Barbara. And um, they, they had regular floods, in particular on the Santa Monica Creek area, the Franklin Creek area. Uh, after the 69 floods, uh, there was a lot of frustration, a lot of lobbying that went on locally. Some of you may recall that. And the Army Corps of Engineers came in and did a major project. They built the Santa Monica Debris Basin up on the Santa Monica watershed. Let's see. up on the Santa Monica watershed, um, the Franklin Basin, and the concrete line channels that uh, come down through to the salt marsh on the two. And so those, those are important flood control facilities that did their job during this storm event. Um, they accumulated massive amounts of debris up here. The salt marsh received tons of sediment that has effectively filled it from both the Franklin Basin side and the Santa Monica Basin side. Um, all of the other basins, uh, Santa Monica is the largest, but all these basins are important, all the way to Gubernador to the east and through here. All of them have been impacted, many of them filled at or over capacity. And that really brings me to the priority work right now before I turn it over to Charlie that's going on. Uh, debris removal is the, the major part of the work that's going on. Um, you see around town there's uh, cranes uh, that are pulling uh, sediment out of the salt marsh, loading it into trucks via Estero Way and Sandpoint Road coming out onto Carp Avenue, uh, going eastbound to, to uh, 7th, down 7th to Linden, to Sandy Land, and then uh, out to Ash, and backing up and dumping their loads of sediment there. Um, soon, there may also be loads coming from uh, the upper debris basins. I know the, that Army Corps of Engineers is doing that work. They've started work at Gubernador and soon will start work in Santa Monica and then move on to the other basins. Um, d uh, sediment uh, debris that's removed out of those may also be brought, brought via truck down to um, Ash Avenue and dumped there. So that's a huge amount of the work. Um, that's going on in the debris basins. Uh, we've been overseeing work also to remove debris from uh, Carpentry Creek in particular um, at Carpentry Creek uh, Bridge, uh, Carpentry Avenue Bridge, I should say, over the creek. You've seen that work. That was very important because not only is it about restoring capacity of the flood control system for Carpentry Creek, uh, it's also about being able to get in there and inspect the bridge and make sure there wasn't damage that would compromise its structure and risk uh, a major arterial route as an alternative to 101 and first responders. Also, Caltrans, as you know, is doing work up on the freeway, the freeway project. Um, there was a lot of debris caught up there, and Caltrans and their contractor has been removing uh, tons of debris up there. Um, the good news is it doesn't appear that there's any significant damage to the new uh, freeway work that was done, although a lot of their 
other earthwork was damaged, and Charlie will talk about that a little bit. Um, also want to mention that um, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the communications side, not at uh, this meeting, but also getting out daily updates that I mentioned. Those are posted on our website. Um, they're also put out at kiosks, uh, the uh, uh, column kiosk at the Seal Fountain. We, we place information at Casitas Plaza in front of Albertsons and at City Hall. We have that information as well as uh, loading it on our website each day, so look for that. That's, uh, again, specific daily updates for Carpinteria, so a, a local focus on that. We also have links where, and as was mentioned in the video, you can go to the county's website for other information about the broader uh, disaster. And then finally, uh, I want to mention that uh, we've been working on transportation. A lot of this work, of course, occurs at the regional level with uh, the uh, County Office of Emergency Management at the EOC to work with Amtrak, to work with the providers of ferry service by boat. Other ways, they're developing a transportation plan as we speak to try to get nurses, doctors, teachers back and forth between Santa Barbara and Carpinteria so that we can uh, get back to some normalcy and provide um, uh, some of the uh, critical services that we need. Uh, I want to mention that uh, also there's volunteers that are helping in this way. Um, uh, Jeff Morehouse uh, wanted me to pass along that uh, you can go to thomasfirehelp.com uh, to look for transportation options by, by air going down to the airport. Uh, in Camarillo and flying up to Santa Barbara if you are a nurse, a doctor, or if you have a critical appointment need uh, for medical appointments that you can only get in Santa Barbara, uh, you can go down there and they will fly you up to Santa Barbara Airport to help you get to that appointment. Uh, there's also warriorangelsrescue at gmail.com and we'll put this information that I just got today on the city's website also or you can see me afterward and I'll get you the information that he wanted us to pass along. Um, so finally, uh, we, we, uh, most, many, many of you may have tried the Amtrak. They are attempting to improve the service. Obviously, it was overwhelmed. Um, so, some of you may have, uh, obviously, my, my punchline was spoiled. But uh, this was the morning train out of Carpinteria. And um, they are adding cars and locomotives to pull those cars um, to try to improve that service. And with that, I'll turn it over to Charlie Ebling. Uh, before Charlie takes over, uh, I want to introduce uh, Chief Ray Navarro, who's here, and he's going to ta uh, talk. Good afternoon, Ray Navarro, Fire Chief, Carpenter and Summerlin Fire District. Uh, we have just completed a helicopter flight over our impacted area, burn areas for Carpenter and Summerlin area to the uh, county line. And what I brought with me is CAL FIRE's expert in the uh, Watershed Emergency Response Team. Uh, they'll give a little bit of information. They're very impacted about developing our contingency plan, along with uh, Chief Gallagher, who I assigned to our staff, along with the Unified Command for the, un in the upcoming rain event that may be happening in the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Norman. Hi. <laughs> My name's Sean Norman. I'm a captain with uh, CAL FIRE, um, and I work in Butte County. And I'm here as part of the incident management team, and we are supporting um, Santa Barbara County Sheriff's, Santa Barbara County Fire Department, Montecito Fire Department, and the uh, Carpinteria Summerlin Fire Department. So um, one of the things that uh, I do on the team is uh, I'm in the operations section, so I'm one of the war fighters. Um, and uh, they pulled me off of that assignment, and I'm uh, helping to build a contingency plan um, that's going to encompass the entire county and it will help us um, to uh, build a matrix and some um, give some tools to the decision makers in your county and in your community um, as we move forward throughout the winter um, so that we have a good set of, um, of kind of data to build a decision making process off when we move into uh, the next storms throughout the rest of the winter. Um, we brought in hydrologists, geologists. We had an, an excellent meeting with them this morning. We're bringing in some very high-tech tools uh, from the military to help us do some um, very extensive elevation mapping um, that will show us the changes in the water courses uh, with the added sediment, and that will give us some really updated factual data to um, potentially predict um, what future events would look like. So we can uh, 
apply that material, that data, and then apply different rainfall rates to that, and will give us some um, good 3D modeling. Um, we did something similar where I work. We went through the Orville spillway uh, crisis uh, this past winter, and we almost had our spillway fail on the uh, largest earthen dam in our country. Um, and so we applied, we used some of the same um, process to uh, model out what future floods could look like, and, and it's a great tool for your emergency managers that you have in your community and in the county to help them with this. Um, and just on a personal note, I was here during the fire. I worked with um, Chief Kovac from your department. I had everything from Casitas Pass to uh, basically to the water treatment plant uh, up on Bella Vista. So um, I know the ground. Um, I flew it, I hiked it, I drove it, fought fire up there and, and held our line as, as the fire marched down on us. And uh, and so um, part of, of why I'm on the team is, uh, is that all of us come with a, a personal connection. Um, and that is that someday you'll be in my community. Um, these gentlemen will be coming to my community. So we're, we're putting forth 100% effort to help stand you all back up. Um, and we're working with your, um, your emergency responders and management uh, people to get uh, the communities back on their feet and get you back to, um, to, to living your lives and, and uh, being normal again. So that's it. Okay, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Charlie Ebling. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Carpinteria. And as Dave mentioned at the beginning of the uh, presentation, we want to make sure that we focused in on Carpinteria and kind of what happened uh, during the storm and then what we're going to be doing as we move forward. So as I mentioned, I'll do a little bit of background. I think Dave covered a lot of that in his... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Dave talked a, a lot about what happened in the, um, with the watershed maps and the uh, debris basin maps, um, and so I'll do a little bit other background. I'll talk a little bit about what actually occurred. Yeah, there we go. I was hesitant to do that. I didn't want to make a big noise, but there we go. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll talk about the damage that we found and uh, our assessment and response. And then, of course, we'll talk about what City Public Works will be doing uh, preparing for the next winter storms. And I also just want to take just one moment to talk a little bit about uh, some words you often hear in these events. Uh, you, he you hear the words 50-year flood or 100-year flood, that kind of thing. Um, what those actually mean is that, for example, a 50-year flood is a 2% 2 per 2 chance per year flood. Uh, the 100-year flood, which we often talk about, is a 1% chance per year flood. Uh, it's highlighted in yellow because that's our national standard. We design our buildings, we design our uh, 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 infrastructure all around the 100-year flood in the United States. Um, you'll also hear in this presentation a little bit about a 200-year flood, and we have not experienced a 500-year flood. Okay, as Dave mentioned, I'll just do this very quickly because I think Dave covered it. In this slide, we show the orange is the burn area uh, in the foothills and mountains above Carpinteria. And then, of course, down here in the yellow is the actual city of Carpinteria, and the areas in between is the unincorporated county. Dave talked about the watersheds, and of course, the most important to the city of Carpinteria is the Santa Monica watershed, the Franklin Creek watershed, and the uh, Carpentry Creek watershed. Ah, shoot. We suddenly stopped. Can we hit the next slide? There we go. Uh, okay. Um, as Dave also mentioned, we have important debris basins up on our creeks. A debris basin is really uh, basically like a miniature lake with its intended purpose is to actually fill in with debris as the creek flows. Uh, our debris basins did fill during this storm. These are the responsibility of county flood control and they are working as quickly as they can to empty them so they're ready for the rest of the season. You know, also we look at uh, the salt marsh and it is actually uh, a debris basin. It does function like one, it does acquire debris 
And ultimately, as you see going on right now, that debris basin also has to be uh, cleaned out to maintain its capacity. So just as a, a little bit of background, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in the city of Carpinteria, we map the effective flood hazard in, in the city. This is your FEMA floodplain map. This is what we assume and we use, uh, assume will occur during a 100 year flood. And this is what we use if we're going to do building and, and uh, uh, setting building standards and main, building uh, freeway projects and all that kind of thing. Um, notice in the blue, the cyan color is the actual floodplain. So we have floodplain over here in the Carp uh, Franklin Creek area and Santa Monica Creek area. And then down here, this is Carpinteria Creek going through uh, the eastern part of the city. And this, this becomes important because as we show you what happened, keep these shapes in mind. Notice that we have the, the floodplain is broader than the creek here. And also we do have the floodplain that travels along the freeway during a 100 year flood. So just keep those two shapes in mind as I talk about what actually happened uh, this last week. So what did happen? We had an overnight winter storm with heavy rain. It was early Tuesday morning. Uh, the creeks actually flowed uh, and the, their flow rose and receded very quickly. This was a very high peak and then it receded very quickly. Uh, Carpenteria Creek actually backed up at the 101 during the peak. Uh, then with, within minutes, this debris blockage let go and a surge went down to the ocean. So we, we did have an actual virtual lake occurring upstream of the 101 uh, Linden, Linden Avenue and Casitas Pass interchanges project. It formed very quickly and then it dissipated very quickly once the debris let go. Um, at or near the, the peak, Santa Monica Creek at Via Real was also observed to be at approximately 65 to 70 percent of capacity. So something we, we really want to impress on people is, is that the two channels Franklin Creek and Santa Monica Creek functioned very well for flood protection and our, our observations during the peak of the storm was that they were around that 65 percent to 70 percent of their capacity. They still actually had capacity to go. Um, uh, we were talking to the USGS, United States Geological Survey. Their preliminary data indicates that Carpentry Creek peaked at 8,800 cubic feet per second at State Route 192. That sounds like a lot, but uh, that was actually only a 50-year event at State Route 192, so a 2% chance per year flood. A 100-year flood that we base our mapping on, that standard, is actually a 12,000 cubic feet per second uh, flow in Carpentry Creek. Uh, alternatively, though, uh, our preliminary estimate in Montecito is that, that they experienced a 200-year uh, event or a 0.5% uh, a chance per year flood. So Montecito actually experienced much more rain in a shorter amount of time than the Carpentry area did. And that was actually obviously a big difference. So the damage in Carpentry, uh, we have damage at Carpentry Avenue Bridge at Carp Creek, a lot of debris buildup. Uh, with that debris buildup, we've established a material storage area at the east end of Carpentry Avenue. Conchaloma Drive had a lot of mud uh, placed on it by the creek. We had spillage of the creek over onto Conchaloma Drive. Uh, a handful of homes in that area actually got mud and water into them. Sixth uh, Street, uh, we are dealing with mud removal and storm drain system repairs there. We had quite a bit of water um, and mud. Uh, uh, accumulate on 6th Street over by the sanitary district offices. Um, at the salt marsh, we had mud and debris that filled the salt marsh and we're working on removing those. And one of the things we want to watch as we go through this um, uh, uh, recovery phase is things like the haul routes. We want to watch where the trucks are going, um, how they're potentially dropping dirt and that kind of thing and impacting our roads as we go. Um, so we're actually paying attention to that and trying to minimize the damage that the recovery effort is actually might make to our uh, transportation system. And then of course we had citywide street cleaning and a citywide storm drain uh, system repairs and cleaning. So as I mentioned before, with that other map, we showed the 100 year floodplain in the city of Carpinteria. 
uh, with all of our observations and, and uh, photographs and, and uh, information that we have about what happened with the flow in Carpenter Creek on that morning of Tuesday, we've put together this map where we think the boundaries of the flood was within the city of Carpinteria. So this is Carpinteria Creek coming down here across the uh, photograph. And then notice we did actually get a flow along the US 101 corridor that went all the way past the Linden Avenue interchange. So as predicted in that map uh, with our 100-year flood, even the, in this 50-year event, we had that flow that started to move towards the west along the freeway corridor. And of course, down here in the lower reaches of Carpinteria Creek, we had flooding at 6th Street. And then down here at the uh, State Park, we also had flooding. And so what I'd like to do is go through portions of the creek. Um, this, we'll zoom in on this aerial photo and this flooding, and then I'll show you some of the damage with photos uh, in those areas as we go. So this is the US 101. Uh, at Carpenteria Creek interchange area. This is where we're building the new bridges over Carpenteria Creek. This is the new Via Real connection with the new off-ramp that you've seen at Casitas Pass. Notice how we show this blob of water, this ponding um, upstream of the freeway. What happened is, is this old freeway, the southbound bridge, that's still there. We have not demolished that bridge yet. That acted a bit like a dam, as we predicted in our 100-year flood mapping efforts. Uh, it did actually dam up with debris, and this lake started forming. And that lake went all the way back behind San Roque Mobile Home Park, and then obviously it also started going to the west along the freeway corridor. That lake didn't last very long. It was very much a peak uh, uh, flow event. The debris at this bridge let go um, within just a matter of tens of minutes, and then all of this water that was built up behind the freeway rushed down Carpentry Creek got to Carpentry Avenue Bridge over Carp Creek, uh, just put a lot of debris in this area, um, splashed over the bridge. We don't think it was overtopped, but we do know that a lot of water splashed up on top of the bridge with a lot of mud and debris. And then, of course, the flow continued all the way down to the ocean. And then I'll have some photos of those various things. And first, I, I want to show that this is the preparations that Caltrans did in the vicinity of the brand new Via Real Bridge. So this was temporary uh, creek restoration efforts that Caltrans will do each year as the project progresses until they do the final um, restoration of the creek. These were a temporary system that was meant to withstand a 25-year flood. Uh, this is another view of the same area with the rock slope protection that was put in place, um, silt fencing, silt wattles, uh, hydro seeding. A lot of effort went into preparing the creek in the, in the area of the project uh, before the winter. And then this is the same area today. So uh, all, all of that rock slope protection is gone. Uh, the silt wattles, the, the fencing, uh, the channel was lowered by six to eight feet. It was scoured very deep by the flow. Uh, and so it just shows you what impact this storm had for just being a 50-year flow, uh, probably double what they were expecting. Um, in this when they did the restoration. Another area uh, just upstream, um, you can see the freeway in the background here to the south. This is uh, Creek Park, and it was heavily impacted. And for things like this is going to be something where we wait a while, let it dry out some, and then we'll have to make some decisions on how we're going to re uh, repair and restore the, the Creek Park. So again, um, we saw the flow coming down Carpentry Creek. We saw the ponding because of the debris that lasted only a few minutes, tens of minutes. We saw the flow going along the freeway corridor to the west, depositing a lot of mud and debris on the freeway. And what we found was, is we found the end of that when we took pictures. This is Linden in the background. We're taking a photo to the west of Linden, and this is where that water reached. So this is literally Carpentry Creek water that got all the way over past Linden and was on its way towards Franklin Creek Watershed, as we show in our modeling for our 100-year flood mapping. So again, this is another part of that same uh, diagram or map that shows this part of Carpentry Creek. This is Carpentry Avenue going through here. The freeway's up here to the right. 
once that debris and uh, water uh, was released from this temporary ponding upstream of the freeway, it came rushing down, and the next bridge was Carpentry Avenue Bridge. And you'll see uh, a, lot of, a lot of people saw the amount, just the um, amazing amount of debris that was left on both sides of the channel upstream of the bridge. And we do have some pictures of that. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, this is uh, the Grand Vita retirement um, facility. Uh, this is where we have that bike path. The bike path is in uh, several feet of mud, and this, this uh, debris pile here is probably 15 to, 15 to 20 feet high. Just another view of the same area of Carpentry Creek with the bike path over here. This is Paul Medell with Public Works. I put him in the photo to show uh, the scale of things. This is a huge pile of logs that's blo blocking the uh, bike path right, at, uh, right when we took this photo. And then you can see the deep mud that was on the bike path. So here's now down next to Carpentry Avenue Bridge. We've already done some work. What our purpose was, we want to get in and be able to inspect the bridge as fast as possible. Uh, we didn't see any cracking on the superstructure um, immediately after the flooding. We didn't see anything wrong with the bridge from the top side, so we went ahead and let traffic stay on the bridge. But we did want to get underneath the bridge and check on it. So the first order of business was to get the uh, excavators in and get the debris away from the bridge so we could see what happened. You could also see that there are six utility conduits that are attached to the outside of the bridge. These are primarily fiber optic cables. Uh, and they were damaged. You can see that they're just sort of hanging loosely. Um, when, and this is af actually after we tied them up to get them out of the way so we could do the work with the excavators. Um, and I'm happy to report that we couldn't find any actual damage to the bridge underneath, so the bridge will remain open. So all that debris is being trucked away. And where we're trucking it to is to the east end of Carpentry Avenue. Uh, we have a uh, construction grade, oops, uh, construction grade mulching machine that can mulch even 18, 24 inch logs, uh, it just plows right through them. Um, and so we're trucking piles and piles of our uh, Carpentry Creek area uh, materials here and any other debris we have, such as from 6th Street and Conchaloma uh, Drive, places like that, that all that debris is coming to the east end of Carpentry Avenue to be processed. Pause for a second. I think sometimes the computer slows down. There we go. So here's a couple photos. Gives you the scale of things. These debris piles are quite large. Uh, this is part of the trucking system that was bringing the debris from the Carpentry Creek area uh, over to the east end of Carpentry Avenue. And then what we did is we closed off the entire uh, end of Carpentry Avenue uh, up to that cul-de-sac that's at Rincon Point. Um, so that we could start piling debris along the entire area, the dirt area plus the roadway. And at this time, we're starting to, starting to pile down the roadway also. So we have a pile going all the way back to that cul-de-sac, and then we're starting to work towards uh, State Route 150 again with all of our debris. And meanwhile, we're processing a, a lot of this with the, uh, the mulching machine. So moving down the reach of Carpentry uh, Creek, we, we're going to talk about the 6th Street area. The sanitary district offices are right here. Uh, Lou Grant um, Preschool is right here. And then also what happened with the creek channel as it went down to the ocean and how the state park was also impacted. Um, and a little out of order, but this is also Conchaloma Drive. This is where we uh, got one to two feet of mud on the road, and also where the homes in the Carpentry area that were most impacted by mud flow, and even some of the mud flow getting in and around the houses, were here on Conchaloma Drive, uh, just near the Arbol Verde intersection. Again, Conchaloma Drive just shows how wet it was and muddy. The, Dirt got, or mud got all the way across the roadway, even uh, up against this house uh, on, the, on the south side of the road. Okay, now this is 6th Street. The uh, sanitary district offices are off to the left here. Uh, one of the problems we had here is that, that not only did we get mud and debris on the roadway, 
but we have two of our major storm drain systems that connect all the way into downtown Carpinteria, come down 6th Street and uh, uh, exit at Carpinteria Creek. During that peak flow, we, we think that we got, actually got a reverse flow of that storm drain system and, and creek water traveled backwards up the storm drain system and during that evening at about 5.30 in the morning we started getting reports of manholes lids that have been popped off on Linden Avenue. We had small geysers, two or three foot high geysers of uh, creek water that were headed uh, popping out of those manholes on Linden. So we think we had a reverse flow and when that reverse flow happened, those storm drain <coughs> pipes that are underneath this roadway filled with mud and debris and they are actually completely plugged right now. And so we're working on uh, figuring out how to get all that mud and debris out of those, uh, out of those pipes. Uh, one way we do it is with vector trucks, and we may actually eventually have to send um, individuals that are certified in confined spaces to take things like electric chainsaws down there and get into those pipes and uh, cut apart the debris uh, to get them open. And or we may end up replacing those storm drain systems. So this is 6th Street. This is another view of 6th Street, right after, uh, or right when we started to uh, do the cleanup. The and the sanitary district offices were up on the upper left. They did a lot of clearing. Yeah, and the sanitary district actually was great. They, uh, they did a lot of the initial cleanup for us on 6th Street, and then we've taken over with our contractor, uh, and we'll be working on the storm drains themselves. So this is Via Real at Santa Monica Creek. Uh, one of the things that occurred here was that just a large, oops, sorry, a large tree came down the channel, lodged itself underneath Via Real Bridge. Um, and just so you can orientate yourself, the 7-Eleven uh, little shopping center is right here in the distance. Um, this is Via Real. This is this large tree that came down uh, and hit the bridge. When it hit, it splashed a lot of mud and debris over on top of the bridge. And at the same time, it actually hit this uh, water main. Uh, later on, we realized that there's a joint right here. You can see it in this photo, and it's a little hard to see, but um, uh, that the, the impact of hitting this pipe actually broke this joint, and that's water leaking out of the water main. So that was one of the areas that the water district had to address uh, right, after the, right after the storm event. And then, of course, the sanitary district also had uh, some issues. This is the uh, water, uh, sewer treatment plant on the other side of this wall. This is Carpinteria Creek. And for years, since 1970s, they've been well protected by uh, a concrete-covered um, revetment wall that uh, really protected uh, the district from high flows in Carpinteria Creek. And what's a little hard to see because of the debris, but right along this line, that wall is actually cracked and fallen off into the creek. So this will probably be one of the largest, most expensive repairs uh, in the Carpentry area as uh, we figure out um, with some, uh, uh, we'll have to do some heavy duty engineering to figure out what to do to uh, replace this uh, protection for their, uh, their wall and the sanitary district facilities. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the state park itself also had some impacts. This is one of the campgrounds. This water is spill out from Carpinteria Creek. Just before it exited to the ocean, it made a li little bit of a turn and also flooded out the campground. So what is Public Works going to do uh, from this point forward, our ongoing preparations? Um, of course, we have a lot of... Um, storm drains and drainage inlets that we still need to clean. We do that every year. Um, every year we do often have uh, heavy equipment on standby. And this year, as you probably saw before the storm, uh, we had an excavator sitting next to uh, Carpentry Avenue Bridge on, uh, near Carpentry Creek. We'll do that again. We'll keep heavy equipment staged throughout the season. Um, we'll continue to do the emergency mud and debris removal on Carp Creek and other areas in the city. Um, We'll, start, we'll begin working on emergency repairs to the 6th Street storm drains. And of course, as I show in the two photos, uh, city, at City Hall we have uh, a sandbag operation going where we have sand, sand delivered and uh, a system for helping uh, citizens get sandbags at City Hall. Uh, today we have 40 cubic yards of uh, sand available and over 25,000 sandbags on hand. 
uh, to help out the com community. And then we'll just, uh, we'll take questions, I, I think, at the end of the presentation. And this is our hospice tree with a little bit of a memorial for the people that uh, perished in Montecito. Thanks, Charlie. All right, one of the most noticeable pieces of infrastructure that was compromised during this incident uh, was our cable system. And Cox Cable has representatives here. Um, some of you may know Terry Dowdy. She's a local resident, a business manager for Cox. She did a fantastic job. She was out in the community at co every coffee shop in town, it seemed, telling, trying to keep people up to date on what was going on and trying to restore that service and what their problems were. And Carla Leal is here, who's going to say a few words about the status of the system. We're all thrilled that it's back to some degree, and she's going to give us an update. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon. My name is Carla Leal, Public Affairs for Cox Communications. I would first like to express how deeply saddened we are at the loss of life and devastation our community has suffered this week. Our deepest condolences to those who have lost loved ones. We know how important it is to stay connected to family and friends in the community during a disaster such as this. Please be assured that our focus has been and continues to be the complete restoration of services to our customers, both homes and businesses, as soon as possible. We have been working closely with the County of Santa Barbara, Cal Fire, the Sheriff's Department, and other utilities in order to, in an effort to make necessary repairs without impeding the search and rescue efforts and now search and recovery by first responders. We experienced significant fiber cuts as a result of the mudslides and our teams have been working around the clock to restore service. By Friday afternoon, we were able to complete the installation of a temporary line, which returns services to many of our customers here in Carpinteria. On Saturday, Cox was granted approval to work in some areas that are critical to service restoration for the remaining impacting customers, and work continues in those areas. Today, we were able to restore ad additional services to those customers. However, other areas still do not have service, and we are still continuing um, restoration to those customers. We have been assisting customers who have called with requests for credits to, the, to those days services were down. For those customers who remain down tomorrow, we will proactively credit those accounts from the time they lost service until service is restored, and they will not need to contact our call centers. Service outage updates will continue to be posted at cox-california.com and on our Twitter at Cox California. We are committed to helping our customers and our community during this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. I just want to relate a short story about the creativity and efforts Cox went through to get the temporary line in place. Um, uh, it was cut through the Montecito area, obviously, near Coast Village Road and Olive Mill intersection. And they were able to make arrangements with private property owners to string line through private properties that were damaged. Um, if you're familiar with the construction project going on at the northwest corner of Coast Village Road and Olive Mill, there's a project in the framing stages there. And as a part of that project, they had developed conduit under Olive Mill Road that was not damaged. Um, for future utilities, they were able to take advantage of that uh, and run the line through that conduit to connect up with their system on Jameson to, to, the, uh, to the east. So just a lot of creativity, a lot of finding a way to uh, get things done, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. All right, with that, I want to uh, bring back up uh, our fire chief, Ray Navarro. Uh, we want to uh, look at uh, going forward now uh, what do we need to do to be prepared? Charlie has talked about that uh, to some degree. We've touched on it here. Um, clearing out debris basins to reestablish capacity is so important now. The system's compromised. That system uh, saved many lives here in the Carpinteria Valley. We need to get it functional again. That's high priority. Ray's going to take it from here and talk about some of the other work going on. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I just want to say that uh, you've responded so well to date. Everyone in this community, as well as Summerlin, have listened to what we've put out there as messaging. And, and as, 
has listened to the point where you are now aware and we have seen the devastation. We don't want that to happen, but it, the potential is there. So what are we doing about it? Right now, uh, as I said, we're building a strategic plan that is going to establish in each of these areas where we have a uh, possible flow uh, in uh, the uh, drainages uh, that we will establish a plan for a response. Uh, also a plan that if we have people who are trapped, we could get them out. Uh, the first night uh, of the rain event, uh, they did over 50 hoist operations of people on their roofs trying to get off and out of the area. So we will have a similar plan. We don't want to do that. So we're asking that in the preparation of establishing that is an evacuation corridor, working closely with the sheriff's department, messaging, and we're gonna use the scientific data that you heard uh, Captain Norman speak about. Not only will we have modeling for you and availability that you'll see at precipitation per inches and what that's gonna look like in these drainages, what it will mean is, as the water flows down, if there isn't any, any debris that gets caught up, and I have to give a, really a, a lot of thanks and kudos to the public works, as well as to the county public works, uh, as we flew today, they are doing extensive work to clear debris in all the debris basins. And I have to tell you, Santa Monica held up very, very well, but there's a lot of work to do there. Uh, working with them and then listening to the plan, what we wanna say is this, um, be prepared when we're giving the message, especially when it comes towards evacuation and a plan for rescuing. Uh, we will base it on that information that says within the next hour, if we have this amount of rainfall, you should leave. And we say that uh, weather is unpredictable and we've all seen it. What we can predict though is that type of flow and, what, and when and where it will hit and who needs to get out. We realize we cannot move 14,000 people in the Carpentria area to where, and we're working on that plan now. We want to, to make the least impact, but be strategic in who we deliver the message to. So that's why we're doing this meeting today, and we'll continue uh, giving you the information as it develops. The third thing we're doing is pre-deployment of our resources to high ground. What that means is we know that uh, within a couple of weeks, at least the modeling we're seeing and the weather, and we're doing sp spot weather forecasting, both from the fire side uh, for the rescue event, and then also for the sheriff's side for the potential of an evacuation, that uh, we will position uh, on high ground, both over on the Bates area and also on the Summerlin area, and in the middle as we can, uh, those resources to be in place prior to any event happening. Uh, that is going to impact you as a community because some of it's heavy equipment that we have to stage. Some of it's going to be emergency equipment we have to stage. So we're asking for your indulgence. If you just understand that you, you may be inconvenienced uh, on some of these roadways uh, because we're trying to do that in, in preparation for any event. Uh, finally, um, we talked about transportation corridor. The 101 is the most important transportation corridor we have, as you know. It is also our emergency response corridor. And so um, what happens here is we work real close with Caltrans. Uh, you may see emergency vehicles and you may see utility vehicles on the freeway running smoothly. Please don't get upset with us. <laughs> it's not, it, it's not a, a pass ticket. It's, it's just the only way we can get to A to B faster than the side roads, all right? And we, we just asked it. What I found, and I manned uh, the uh, road blockages. Uh, when people saw us going through the road blockages, uh, uh, several cars followed us. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people got to Summerlin real quick behind my red lights. <laughs> but I have to tell you, that is not what we want you to do. Uh, if anything, ask a question. And we were able to work out a plan uh, right there at Santa Claus for people who left, uh, as an example, Summerlin, but couldn't get back in. We'll work with you, you just have to work with us. Now in preparation, you have to think of yourself as going through a hurricane. If there's anything you want to, to look at uh, when you go home on, inter, uh, on the internet tonight and the YouTube, look at the aftermath of any hurricane and what those people had to endure. And you can think of them in Houston, uh, Puerto Rico, Harvey. Water is not going to reside or recede quickly if we're flooded. So what does that mean? Well, you have a couple of things to take care of. I always said, uh, if you're going to try to weather the storm, 
uh, and you're going to stay in place, then you should plan to have at least enough water on hand. What does that mean? A case of Costco water, if you will, 24 bottles per person for a week. You need to think about sanitation. They may have to shut water off or water may be disrupted so you won't have sanitation or flows, uh, bathrooms and things. So think along those lines. And uh, you also have to think about uh, your preparation like an earthquake for uh, information, uh, radio on battery, uh, charging, get uh, battery chargers for your cell phones because uh, when electricity is shut down for safety reasons, they may not come back up. So you need that backup. And then finally, uh, uh, flashlights, uh, lights, headlights, things that you can do in, in the dark if that happens as it did on, on the morning uh, at early 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning when this happened. So uh, we are saying this as a final note, and I really appreciate the mayor and, and, and city manager and all those who have worked together in this community and all of you. Uh, we are safe right now. And with some rain and what we saw today, the clearing of the uh, debris flows, uh, we still have impact in the burn area. And they're telling us that any uh, precipitation that is a half inch to an inch in a, in a burn scar area where we see today could produce another flow. Uh, we don't know how big that's going to be, it could be another flow. And it just means that you need to be listening to our messaging. And we will try to get out ahead of that with the information so you can make a wise decision to leave. Now, if you decide to leave, I want you to know you may not come back for a while if you're impacted. If you're not impacted, we'll see that you get back home. And that's the best promise that we can make for you. And again, we were gonna keep you safe. I staffed all of our uh, firefighters, did a, a, a wonderful job. You, you should just know that they put everything they could to be here and as well happen in our neighbors, Montecito. Uh, we have been at this since December 4th and there's been no relief, but we do that because uh, we really feel that you are loving on us. We wanna love on you. You're our community, so that's what we'll do. Thank you. And I'd like to bring Lieutenant Olmstead up now. Um, and uh, just to dovetail off of what the chief said uh, in terms of preparedness, personal and family preparedness, I hope you're all aware of the uh, Santa Barbara Aware and Prepare website. We train off of that and use that uh, to conduct our own community emergency response team training. Um, look for those opportunities. Go to the Aware and Prepare site. Not only is there tons of good information there about how to prepare your household for a disaster, um, but you can also sign up for alerts. And those are the alerts you get on your phone. You can choose where you get it, your t landline telephone, your cell phone, your web, uh, your, um, your email account, all of those things. Lieutenant. Thanks, good afternoon. Um, it's been a long week. Um, basically, just about everyone on the sheriff's department has worked since the event. Either, if they're off duty, they're working the uh, event somewhere, or they're work, or they're working the regular station. So it's been a long week for all of us, and you know, our hearts for men's and women of the sheriff's office go out to the entire community because the whole community has been affected. Uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is our evacuations and how we do it, what we do, and what we think about. And when it comes to evacuations, we just don't all of a sudden say, let's evacuate everyone. Um, we really take it seriously because we know what we're doing. When we go and say there's a mandatory evacuation, we start knocking on your door. We know that you're displacing you out of your house for maybe an undetermined amount of time. And usually it's quick. Usually we're saying, get out now so you don't have enough time to get your property and medication stuff. So that's, that's the importance of being prepared, having those go bags, being ready to go, um, especially when we start seeing these, if we see a weather event come in or with the fire, we saw the, wire, the fire creeping uh, west. So it's really being prepared. Um, so when we do these evacuations, like I said, we really take them serious. Um, so when we look at uh, how we do evacuations, um, the process we've used now is we have those zones, and you might have heard the zones a lot in, uh, during the Thomas fire. And those zones started um, about the time of the Zaka fire. And you know, for years, we had these brush fires, and uh, they were in the back country, and our fear was always that these fires were gonna come over into the front country. And finally, just about every fire we've had in the last 10 years has been in the front country. 
So um, during Zaka, when we thought that it might come over to the front country, we started setting up these evacuation zones. And we pretty much looked at these zones and we went all across the county. So all across the county has these evacuation zones. And uh, we named them, numbered them, and uh, we went and looked. And primarily they were developed sort of based on population, but they were also based on major streets. So we could define them pretty well because as you guys, everyone, when we put out an evacuation warning or a mandatory um, evacuation, everyone's wondering about those boundaries. So they were basically based on good boundaries that we could describe easy, that people could recognize. And so what we've had is we had these uh, evacuation zones. And then as we see or we try to predict what's going to happen, then we start putting these, e, uh, these zones into mandatory or a warning for evacuation. When we decide to do that, um, wherever the incident we think is going to be centered, we put into a mandatory. And when we do the mandatory, what that means is we call in a lot of resources and uh, we call in search and rescue, we call in a lot of law enforcement, and whatever zones we're going to mandatory evacuate, we go door to door and we start knocking on people's doors and telling them to get out. Um, now, the little bit definition on uh, evacuations a mandatory or a warning um, mandatory warning is just an advisement hey there's something that might be coming you're close to the area um, just be aware be ready to leave at a moment's notice when we go into a mandatory evacuation and we're knocking on your door we're asking you we're telling you get out of your house because we want to protect you now you don't have to leave you know we're not going to pick you up and carry you out of your house Okay, which some people think, but we go, we tell you, we knock on the door, we document what you're going to do. Usually the search and rescue or a deputy will ask you or, or one of the police um, departments that we have come in and help. They're going to ask you, they might have a list and say, okay, are you guys leaving? Are you, are you staying? And uh, we go and we document that. And a lot of times we'll throw, we'll tie maybe some crime scene tape or search and rescue will use some sort of flagging and it might be on your mailbox on a gate, and that tells us that this house has been checked. Now, if you choose to stay in shelter in place during a mandatory evacuation, that's, we don't advise it, but if you do, that's your choice. What that means, though, is at some point, when you decide to leave and you go out that uh, roadblock, then you're not gonna be able to come back in. That's what the mandatory evacuation means. So we try to lock that area down to try to prevent people from going because, like I said, we take these serious because one, we want to protect the community, but also as everyone leaves the community, we also want to patrol that area and try to prevent any kind of thefts or looting from taking place. So that's why we want to put up the roadblocks and we want to try to prevent people from going in. So we, we go and we do this evacuation and then we monitor the uh, emergency. If it grows bigger, then we start increasing that area and maybe some areas that were put in warning will now go into mandatory like we saw in the fire and we saw with the exclusionary zone that we expanded it a few days ago um, with uh, all the rescue operations that were going on now once we have you evacuated we put a lot of patrols in there we have the roadblocks and we have a lot of patrols in there um, in this incident um, we've had all the law enforcement agencies from santa barbara county helping us we've had um, dozens of law enforcement from San Luis County patrolling the area and uh, we've been requesting other mutual aid resources to come in to help us patrol because we're doing this long sustained uh, um, event now when we go and like I said we really take these evacuations serious and we understand the uh, the hardship that goes through everyone once they get uh, um, sent out of their house so just as important it is to get you guys out of the house, it's really important for us to get you back in the house. And that is constantly evaluated. And I know sometimes during the fire or even this event, it took us a while to get the mandatories back in to uh, where everyone can go in, obviously just releasing you guys recently. Um, but we wanna make sure that you guys are safe, but we know there's that hardship. And in these sustained operations, there's a lot of times that we figure out, okay, how can we get, because someone's going to forget something really important. And we've, we have done and we, we have made arrangements in this event to try to get people up to their property to, to get important stuff, you know. 
you know, serious medication that they got to take that they can't get refilled, or um, we've worked a lot with animals trying to get animals fed and stuff like that. So, like I said, we take it very serious. It's not just let's kick everyone out of their house and then forget about it. So, every day, every minute, we're evaluating when can we repopulate uh, um, the area. Now, if nothing happens, and say, like in the Thomas fire, we, we saw that and uh, we saw the fire and there wasn't any infrastructure damage or extreme infrastructure damage, then it's a lot easier to repopulate uh, the, the zones or the communities. In an event like this, where we have a lot of infrastructure damage, gas, power, sewer, water, it's gonna take a long time to get people repopulated in some of those areas. Um, luckily, we were able to get you in after a few days. Um, so, but up there, it's going to be a lot harder because we have to have the utility sign off and, uh, and evaluate whether it's safe to go back in. Um, once we, uh, um, when we go to make the decision to repopulate, then we, uh, depending on if there's damage, we'll try to let the residents only in. We'll sort of downgrade that mandatory a little bit to allow residents to go in, and then uh, we'll open it up to the everyone and we'll pull the roadblocks um, but like I said I can't stress it enough we do take these seriously we know we're uprooting you um, we really request and hope that people will cooperate and uh, and leave um, their house I mean I know it's a hard decision it's hard to get hotels they end up getting expensive but we really hope and and part of preparation is maybe thinking about having a having a place that you can go having you know no you know, asking a friend, hey, if I ever get um, uh, evacuated or maybe the storm's coming or maybe the fire's coming, maybe set that up ahead of time. So 3 o'clock in the morning, you're not wondering where you're going to go um, if you don't have to go to a hotel. Um, so just try to be prepared um, as best you can for this, um, for any of these emergencies. I mean, unfortunately, over the last 10 years, we've had to evacuate a lot of areas. And, uh, and then with this storm system, or this winter, we have a lot of the watershed destroyed, and uh, it's going to be a long winter for us. And uh, in the future, obviously, we're working with uh, all the fire departments, and we're working with CAL FIRE, and we're evaluating our evacuation process and the various decisions based on the information we get. So thanks. Um, I'll be around for questions. Thank you, Lieutenant. That does bring us to the Q&A portion of the meeting. So um, what I'm going to do, and again, thank you, Matt Organista, for using social media to get some <laughs> solicit questions. And so I'm going to start with a set of questions that came in through Matt on future storms, and then we'll take some questions from the audience, and then move on to some other topics that we received some feedback on. So future storms, here's, I'll read through the three questions, and then uh, we can decide who's going to answer them up here. And uh, Chief, if you could come back up. Uh, what is carpentry a duty to prepare for the next storm? What areas in are in danger with the next rain, and what, can the and what can those do to prepare? What are they expecting for carpentry if there is another storm like we just had? So you've heard a little bit of the uh, answer to these, but Charlie, I'll let you review in summary response to those. What, what, what are we doing to prepare? Um, what are the danger areas, and uh, what do we... What do we uh, what are we expecting in terms of future rain? Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, as I said in my presentation, we do have a number of things we're doing, but also keep in mind as we clear Carpentaria Creek, um, that work that's being done and the, and the debris that's being um, turned into mulch out at the east end of Carpentaria Avenue, um, that's actually very critical for us. Getting the debris out of the creek is key to uh, restoring its capacity. So, and also keeping, it's a safety issue. We don't want that debris to continue down the creek and do any more damage to anything else. Um, but a key part of that removal is the capacity of the creek. We need to get the debris out of it so it can flow enough water. I think the danger areas that we heard about um, from the fire chief and the fellow from Cal Fire um, remain the same. They're the same watersheds that were at risk above Santa Monica, above Carpentaria Watershed. Um, and what we heard, um, uh, which is of great concern, is the risk hasn't changed that much. The hillsides are still laden with debris that are capable in a similar type of storm as we had last time of unleashing mud and debris flows. 
Um, the next storm, uh, we have, uh, you well, know. I would, I would just quickly go. point out that I'd go back to our 100-year flood map. This is where we've modeled what happens in a, in a bigger storm. So we had a 50-year storm in the Carpentaria area. This would be a, a much bigger storm. But if we talked about risk areas, uh, again, we would have the Carpentaria Creek corridor. And if we get the flows uh, on the creek, on the freeway again, we'd be concerned with the Franklin Creek area uh, around the center of the city. Uh, this is uh, San Inez Avenue right here, uh, and uh, Aragon um, and Carpentry Avenue here on the south side of the freeway. So uh, this is another area of concern, plus the beach area. You know, our, uh, our perfect storm in Carpentry is a high surf, a rain, and a high tide. And when we have those three things occur, and the beach area becomes very vulnerable. So I'd say those are our three big areas, the beach area, the center of the city around Franklin Creek, and of course the Carpentry Creek uh, corridor uh, are our risk areas. Thanks, Charlie. All right, uh, Michael Avery is out in the audience with a microphone. And if you raise your hand, I'll come a, to you. See a question Leslie has back here, Michael. He's coming around the, the bend there, and he'll come down and I'm coming. take a question. Hi, thank you. I have two questions. The first one is we saw that a lot of people were in a voluntary evacuation zone in Montecito that was hit very hard. So I, I want to ask about the voluntary versus the mandatory. And we all know that the 101 South is really now our only escape route if we need to leave. So we really need really early warning because what happens, all those hills are denuded between here and Ventura and not just La Conchita, but there's portions of the hills that go right up to the northbound that are held up with boards that look like toothpicks trying to hold up a mountain. Thank you. So for uh, the first question, it's, we try to use the best information we have to try to determine uh, how many, uh, what areas we put into mandatory and what areas we put into uh, warning. The, like I said, we, we take uh, evacuations really serious. So the problem we have, and even in this one, I mean, when we started evacuating uh, on Monday, it was 65 degrees and not raining really. And so there, you know, in, in the entire area, there wasn't a lot of compliance with people leaving just because of the conditions. I mean, when they when the fire was out, they saw the flames or the ash falling and stuff like that. So one of the things is we got to use the best data that we can get and the best information. And as we bring more and more experts in that the CAL FIRE team's going, we're going to be able to make uh, you know improved decisions and different points that, OK, if it's going to rain this much, then we're going to evacuate this area. And so that's part of their mission is to identify uh, with more technology, how to predict more areas to evacuate. Um, and it, it sort of goes with the, uh, uh, your question on the southbound 101 or even northbound. That's the unique thing with uh, Santa Barbara County is there's a north way out and a south way out. And if you're somewhere in between where the road goes out, then you're sort of stuck in this area. And so that's another thing is that we take these, like I said, we take these evacuations serious and it's, we try to time it to where, okay, it's, it's, it's important to leave now because if we, if we decide to do it too early, then we don't get a lot of compliance. And, you know, obviously we don't want to do it too late because then it puts more people at risk. And so it's, it's a lot of decisions that are made and, and really we count on a lot from the community. And, uh, you know, when, when we look at the prior fires that we've had and even this event, um, uh, we've, the community's really cooperated in leaving the area safely, especially with the fires as, as fast as the fire was coming in and, uh, we were trying to get people out. The, the community members really cooperated with us and were able to leave. There was no accidents when leaving. But like I said, it gets back to doing that right time to where we get that compliance of everyone rather than everyone saying, oh, we're going to stay here. I mean, it, it's December and we have 70 degree weather. Um, it's just a unique, strange thing. And we're saying the, the floods are coming. So uh, it's just to try to get that right timing and decision done. Before you go on, I'll just give you a little bit. So one of the questions they had from the media was the weather. 
Uh, the future weather forecasting that we've seen and we're going to continue to do with the Oxnard uh, NOAA station. It's uh, Tuesday's weather ban. Looks like there'll be some precipitation moving out of uh, San Luis Obispo towards the back area, the back country. It's burned. Uh, in January 19th and 20th would be the soonest we would see uh, anywhere from one tenth to one half a percent in the front country as a potential for rain. And then January 24th, which is the futuring out, uh, they're looking at a potential uh, of four inches of rain that could come through the area. So this is what we're planning for. So when you hear us talk about this, uh, it goes right back to the evacuation question, which was southbound. Uh, what we do know is this. We, we have to go and which we will coordinate with Office of Emergency Management who sets up sheltering. Sheriffs are gonna do the evacuation. It's up to the fire agencies and the responders to set the management decision points at which and what time are we going to do that. Uh, we will want to do evacuations during the daytime and not a nighttime, so that's one. Second, it may be 12 hours to maybe 18 hours in planning so therefore, as we're telling you as, you, as you get ready to leave, it's like our ready, set, go. You should have all your purpose, important information, papers, uh, medications, and things that you need that are in a go bag or somewhere where you can put that in your car and be ready to go when we say it's going to be mandatory. Now, if it's, if it's a voluntary, obviously that's your choice. Uh, but going to the south, uh, as we're talking about it now, um, you're, once you leave Carpinteria, you're in Ventura County, and it's up to them as to what shelters might be available for us. So we have to work through our county offices to see what that might look like, and we just don't have an answer just yet. And so preparedness, preparation, keeping your response on weather, and, and what we uh, have planned to do in the future uh, is to station a person who's gonna give us the latest information from Oxnard Weather Service when we start to see rain pending three days out, and they'll be in the office looking every day, giving us an update, what we call spot weather, okay? Thanks, Chief. Next question, here, Michael, thank you. <clears throat> oh, you know, hold it, thank you. Um, I have a prepared statement, and I also have an email that I received from Doss Williams that I'd like to read. Um, the first part of my comment is I'm a landowner on Sandy Land on the ocean side. I'm also the president of the Sandy Land Homeowners Association. Our comments are based upon the dumping of the debris on the beach at Ash Street. We believe the materials are hazardous and toxic. And let me explain why we believe that. Because of the debris runoff, as we've seen from the maps and exhibits today, um, it went across the freeway. It includes um, debris from up above where you had the fire. There is a possibility of the following, and this is just a very limited list of acid, antifreeze, asphalt, batteries, cleaning products, diesel, freon, household chemicals, hydrocarbons, medications, oil, pesticides, petroleum, propane, rubber, and radioactive material that's used in medical devices, sewage and effluent, and unfortunately, potentially, blood of victims and animals, as well as other pathogens. We are well aware that we have a homeless community in this area. Many of them reside under the bridges and reside in the streams. I believe that it needs the soil that's being dumped on the beach needs to be tested and documented where it's coming from. You should be handling this as you would an oil spill, which you did before. Why is this debris being dumped on a public beach? You have now created a public nuisance. You have potentially contaminated the houses on either side of that, as well as anybody flowing downstream. Luckily, we do have the berm up there, but it's not, and it's on the city website, and it's on the county website that the soil is coming from both the salt marsh as well as the 101 freeway. We know the land next to the 101 freeway contains some of the most toxic chemicals due to runoff from the freeway. Why is this not being handled and put at a contained site with vinyl tarps down within either the city or the county? And also, as we've mentioned earlier today, we are no longer in an emergency situation, we're in recovery. The permits that were issued previously were emergency permits and are probably no longer valid. Therefore, as of today, the dumping on the beach should have ceased. 
Thank you. Appreciate those comments. And then I can let me read you Doss Williams' email. Why don't we hold on that because okay. I'd like to respond uh, uh, to your to your comments. So I, th I think these are important comments, important concerns that we've heard out there. The county has heard them, and I want to give a little bit of context. We are still in an emergency, and this emergency is going to go on for some time. There was emergency permits that were issued by the Army Corps of in Engineers for disposal in the surf zone on the beaches in both Carpentry at Ash Avenue and then out in Goleta. Uh, why, why would they do that? Um, we're in an extraordinary situation with mounds and mounds of debris, and we know that the clock is ticking, as we've talked about today, to the next incident. It's incredibly important to reestablish that capacity. So this is a life-saving measure on uh, looking forward basis, incredibly important. In disaster response, that's number one priority, save lives, and we've got to get to that. There are other priorities, also important priorities, protecting property from further damage, protecting the environment. These are also priorities in disaster response, but they cannot be higher than that number one priority of saving lives. And so that was the basis for the decision. That's why the Army Corps of Engineers allowed for the disposal on the beach, and that's what's happening. In that context, I also want to say that, as, as we all know, uh, living in a beach community, after any first flush winter rain, and that's what we really had here, um, we get beach closures, we get contamination on the beach. So in many ways, this first flush is no different than first flushes that we always get the same kinds of materials from our roads all through Carpentaria that go into the storm drain system and end up down in the beach and the ocean waters, unfortunately, uh, including pollutants, um, uh, are in there this time. Um, so that's, that's uh, I think, an important uh, context and understanding. I don't know, Charlie, if you uh, wanted to add anything to that. Well, I just think real, real quickly, the only other thing is physical space. Um, you'll see in some of the photos I, I, I showed that uh, we're using the limited spaces that uh, Carpentaria has. We have the east end of Carpentaria Avenue. There's those large dirt areas at the intersection of State Route 150 and Carpentaria Avenue. Um, those are highly coveted areas. Uh, believe it or not, uh, right after the event, we had many agencies ask if they could use those areas. Um, and uh, we did allow Caltrans and some others to, to uh, uh, utilize the space. And then we also reserved space for ourselves because we knew this critical life-saving uh, issue of getting debris out of Carpentaria Creek was going to be our top priority. We have to get the debris out of Carpentaria Creek, get it over to the east end of Carpentaria Avenue and, and process it. And that's to maintain the capacity of the creek. Uh, in a life-saving effort, uh, making sure that we don't, if we do get another flow, that we don't have all that material go down the creek and or uh, that it causes overflowing of the creek because we don't have enough capacity. Thanks, Charlie. And then finally, I just want to reiterate what we've been talking about here. Um, the material that's being dumped on the beach now is coming primarily out of the salt marsh. So um, it's possible that uh, trips could come from cleanup of the freeway that occurred uh, in the past, uh, uh, right after the cleaning of the freeway. Um, but those truck trips would have been very limited. The, the primary uh, uh, deposition of material has come from the salt marsh. It's possible going forward that we'll start to see some sediment material coming out of the debris basins up in Santa Monica. All right, let's uh, move on uh, to the next, Michael. <coughs> But can, can we take, take, can we take uh, questions first? I'm sorry. So, okay, well, we can get back to it. We can get back to it. I, I promise before we end, we'll come back and we'll be able to hear your statement. But let's go to the next question. Ma'am, we got a lot of people who would like to speak, so we're going to come back to you. For, if you've got a statement from uh, Mr. Williams, we can come back to that. Yes, Michael, next question. Uh, my question is regarding the shoreline. Um, I've read that there's a lot of contagions and whatnot in the debris that's washed up and also being put there. But for those of us, for example, I monitor for Santa Barbara Channel Keepers, Marine uh, Protection Agency, the East and West Beaches, can we walk in on the beach and if so where can we walk and what can you speak to the quality of the water as well as the debris and how that relates to how we can at least walk along the our shoreline 
Thank you. I appreciate that. There's a couple of aspects to that uh, question that are important. Number one is the County Public Health Department has issued a closed ocean waters uh, notice um, because of the potential after the first flush winter rains uh, of contamination of the ocean water. So the waters are closed right now and we've posted signs related to that. Um, that may change. They continue to test waters and as the, uh, if, it, uh, if they come up with a clean bill, uh, they could reopen some, some areas. The second is that material that's on the beach is dangerous. I would recommend the debris material, the woody debris and the other waste that's piled up on the debris that was flushed out. Could have sharps in it, nails, lumber, other things, pieces of metal. Um, it could have uh, hazardous materials mixed in with it. So we don't recommend that people uh, allow children to play on the material, that they collect the material. It's best to be uh, left alone. Some of that will wash back out in the ocean. If it remains there, uh, there will be a cleanup effort uh, on, on, that, uh, on that debris. The beaches are open. They're not closed. So on the sandy beach, you are allowed to be on there. We just, of course, you're advised to stay clear of the water and stay clear of the built-up debris on the beach. You. You're welcome. David, um, next question. Um, I'm, I'm down in Ventura and driving up, and what's clear to me, and, and I appreciate so much all that the County of Santa Barbara has been doing, the city as well, um, but it, it appears that there's a lot of miscommunication in terms of the County of Ventura. Um, I know, I didn't know until Thursday that the freeway is open to Carpinteria. You see that when you arrive at Carpinteria, but I thought it was going to be a major effort to get through. So if there's a way that Caltrans can put a sign up in Ventura, I know that as a, as a representative of small and large businesses here in Carpinteria, um, they're devastated. And, and it would be so powerful to just simply put that sign up and let people know that the roads are open to Carpinteria. It would be helpful. I, I will speak to that. Yesterday at the... Uh, Office of Emergency Management and the press briefing uh, talked to CHP and Caltrans at our cooperators meeting in the morning, and they were going to message in Ventura that the 101 was open to um, to Summerlin. I think the, the closure uh, was going to be there at Padaro, and that was going to be the message in Ventura, that people could get that far. But they were going to change that to go to Padaro. So in other words, remove the 150, let people know they can go all the way through to uh, Summerlin. So we'll check on that for you. Actually, I can add to that. Um, it was decision based on uh, not impacting Summerlin and the equipment getting up that it's going to, the closure is going to remain at 150. I know there's some uh, uh, signs, um, uh, the messaging signs that talk about it in Ventura, but uh, when I get back to the uh, incident command post, I'll talk to the CHP and Caltrans is there, and I'll see what kind of messaging they have, and I'll express uh, um, your message to them, and maybe they can work something out. All right, we're going to go back for a couple of minutes here to questions that we got on transportation from uh, social media. So the first question was, is it possible to have a Metrolink system between cities for commuters? Second question, is it possible to have multiple trains only running from Carpinteria to Santa Barbara and Ventura to Santa Barbara? Can we get trains that revolve around business hours? And is it possible to use the Venico Pier for ferry service? So these are, as you can imagine, we've been getting lots of uh, good ideas <laughs> for improvement. Uh, stopgap measures. Um, in terms of, uh, and, and I want to say that there's, again, a lot of thought going into transportation planning to fill this gap right now, in particular for doctors, nurses, teachers, so we can get schools open, get appointments filled, and be able to adequately staff hospitals. Uh, um, the, um, uh, the system right now that's run by Amtrak, they're trying to bolster the capacity, so they're adding cars and they're doing that. Um, in terms of bringing in a metro lick system, I'm not sure at this stage on quick notice if that's feasible. Again, they're looking at adding cars and improving service on the existing metro link. Um, is it possible to have trains running from Carpinteria to Santa Barbara? This is a really interesting question because if you followed a little bit of our city council meetings, you know recently that the city supported a, a grant for a project that would add a siding right at the Carpinteria station that was just big enough for an, for an Amtrak train. And what that would allow for is the passing of true Amtrak trains or for an Amtrak train to be in the siding to allow a freight train to go by. 
Um, the challenge right now in our corridor from down Ventura Way up through Santa Barbara is that there's not enough passing room. So trains have to wait in different locations. If you've ever been on the train, you've done this. You've waited down in Ventura, you've waited up in Santa Barbara for a freight train to come and pass that might have had priority. So this is the way the system works now. Very poorly, very inefficiently, it results in a lot of delays. And that's the problem we have even on an emergency basis that we have now, is that we can't get more trains through that system with only one track. They need sidings to do that. So adding uh, trains from Carpentry to Santa Barbara uh, uh, likely not feasible for that reason, the lack of passing and capacity on the track itself. Um, scheduling of the trains, I know they're looking at scheduling. If they can adjust hours to uh, do better for commuters, workers, I know they're going to be considering that. Uh, and I don't know if you, you had anything you wanted to add to that, Charlie. The um, uh, Jump in here, guys, if you do. And then on the Venico Pier, uh, this idea has come to us a few times, and we passed it along to the folks uh, um, through the Emergency Operations Center of the county who are in contact with the commercial uh, ferry providers, Island Packers, and the other one that I'm not remembering, that are doing great work ferrying people from uh, the Ventura Harbor up to the Santa Barbara Harbor to see if it's feasible. Of course, they would have to get the uh, permission from the property owner. Currently, it's uh, Chevron, by the way, uh, who's taken over for Venico. So that's an interesting idea, and we're going to explore it to see if it would be any ben a benefit. All right, uh, Michael, let's go back to questions from the audience. Um, hi, and thank you for all the great information. I live not in the downtown area that has been focused on, which is understandable, but I live on the on the Villarreal area in, in the Sandpiper Mobile Home Park. So I'm a little bit confused about all the different watersheds and which one would impact our area as well as which watershed would impact the areas outside to, well, I call it the right, I don't know my south from my north, but uh, you know, the, what would appear to be the southern area, which would be Baylord, Bates, and so, my living on the Villarreal area north, north, <clears throat> which watershed should I be keeping an eye out for for danger where I live? Try to get the watershed map back up. Yeah, I'd like to get I'd like to get the watershed map back up. I think the computer is just running a little slow. Can we do that? It from may up at shift. The computer? Um, let's see. The computer's up there behind the, up by the, oh, there we go. That did work. Thank you. Okay. So, Sandpiper, correct me if I'm wrong, is the one at the west end of the city? Yep. Uh, right in this area? Yeah. Uh, close, to the, close to the polo field. Right. And that, that is, that area of the city actually, uh, is kind of in between watersheds. We have the Arroyo Peridon watershed here that goes down to the, the west end of Santa Claus Lane, Padera Lane area, and then we have the Santa Monica watershed that comes down and gets into the Santa Monica Channel and then goes out through the, uh, the salt marsh. Sort of in between this area is Cravens Lane, and as many of you know, Cra Cravens Lane itself kind of turns into a little creek when, when we get rain. Uh, uh, Cravens rain, Lane that water flows down Cravens Lane, gets into a storm drain system, and then goes over to that basin behind Kim's Market. We all call that basin Kim's Basin. And then it crosses underneath the freeway and gets out into the salt marsh. Uh, that system there functions fairly well, um, but it is uh, vulnerable to a 100-year flood. So I think you would want to watch what's happening on Cravens Lane. Um, and, uh, and then also just these other watersheds that are around it are good indicators like Santa Monica and Arroyo Peridon. So I, I think if you look, just looked at this area and especially living in that part uh, of town, if I, were, if I lived there, I'd be looking at how, uh, what's happening on Cravens Lane and what's happening over at, at Kim's Basin. And if those were starting to fill up or if Cravens Lane looked like it was turning into much more than just a little creek, uh, it might be time to uh, consider my options. And actually, I was going to, um, I forgot to mention a couple things. 
um, when it comes to evacuations. So if it's immediate, um, I'm sure everyone's gotten those emergency alerts that wake you up in the middle of the night and it might not pertain to you or not. Um, uh, but uh, if it's immediate, we're gonna put that out and it sort of hits all the cell phones in a particular area. So you might get that. Or what you should do is go to the county's uh, website and there's a couple things and they've been trying to improve it and trying to get better messaging out. But you can register um, and put your zip code in and then that will give you uh, messages also on your phone. Also one of the things with the county's website is they have that county inter interactive map and whenever we put evacuation zones, whether it's mandatory or warning, you can uh, click on the map and then you can drill down to your actual street. So if you're curious about whether, you know, if you can't quite read where the, the boundaries are when we do put these uh, warning zones out, you can uh, scroll in and you can find your exact street on that map. And they're also going to be putting other information w involving this incident and future incidents where they put more and more information on that map. So I would go to the county's uh, website and go to whereandprepare.org and you can register various uh, 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 phones and your landline. Um, uh, you can go to the sheriff's office and they have, they'll link it to register it so we can do, we used to call it a reverse 911 where it would go to the houses, but I would try to register for as, as much as possible in your area. Um, if something happens in Santa Maria, more than likely you're not gonna get the, the alert, um, but sometimes technology messes up and so, uh, um, those are different ways to get uh, messages. And also just, um, we're not gonna say like the watershed's going or evacuate out of the watershed. So just be more like Charlie said, be more concentrating on knowing your area and if the, the river's rising there, but also just be a uh, monitor uh, the county's website and make sure you're registered uh, um, uh, with all the, aler the emergency alerts. Okay. Thank you. All right, Michael, uh, where are you at? Next. Uh, I uh, live at Third and Ash, and at 5 a.m. last Tuesday morning, I looked out my window and there was sort of like a lake there at the estuary. And um, I'm thinking two inches of rain then. Um, you're talking about maybe four inches coming. Um, how? how what I don't know, and I'm new to town, is how fast does the estuary drain into the ocean? Um, is that, I need some sort of reassurance about all that. But earlier when I talked about the risk areas for the city, um, that is our risk. And when I mentioned our, our perfect storm without the fire, the fire is kind of added into this. Uh, the perfect storm is the high tide, uh, a rainstorm, and a high surf. And if you think about it, at Third and Ash, we do get that ponding. Um, that's trying, water's trying to get in those storm drain systems right there at that intersection out into the salt marsh. But if, salt, if the salt marsh is full, water has no place to go. And if you think about it, we really don't have a way to pump it out to the ocean either. It's just gonna come right back in. So that's a, a low-lying area, and we know it, it tends to get a foot or two of water, in the worst case scenario, a, um, a t high tide that's over seven foot. Uh, with a bit of a, um, uh, a surf and a rain. Um, and that's, uh, and we've watched that over the years and that does occur. And really it's a conundrum because there's really nothing we can do with the water. It, do, it can't go anywhere. We could, we could pump it out to the ocean, but other water is gonna be right there in the salt marsh coming right in. So as you've noticed in the beach area, one of the things we've done is uh, with our 100 year uh, floodplain knowledge and our building codes that go along with this is you see the houses in that area as they redevelop and get replaced, the houses are going up and that's the very reason why. All right, thank you, Charlie. I'm gonna go back to uh, a miscellaneous question we got from social media. It was a question about um, what are some of the other agencies that they see around town? What are they and what are their purpose and what are they doing? 
Um, it was mentioned before that uh, um, the sanitary district, Carpentry Sanitary District, and the water district uh, were helping out in Montecito for Montecito Water and Sanitary to get reestablished and uh, had had a little damage on some of their infrastructure. So in Carpinteria, uh, there's a city of Carpentry, and then we have independent special districts, the Carpentry Sanitary District and the Va Carpentry Valley Water District that also operate. They include the entire area of the city and then an unincorporated area around it. They have their own elected boards and their own managers. Um, they uh, also um, have, uh, have done, are out doing work now to ensure that their infrastructure is safe. There's also um, work uh, being done at Dump Road in Carpentry Avenue, a, what they call a laydown yard was set up there. And there you'll see the gas company in Southern California Edison with lots of material and lots of people. What they're doing is basically staging their emergency response operations to go up into the damaged areas beginning around Toro Canyon and heading west and towards Santa Barbara to do repairs on their infrastructure as quickly as possible. So that's some of the activity that you see around town. All right, Michael. I'm right here. I see you back there. I'm going to be up here first. Make your way back there. Um, I'm wondering if it's if there's a timeline in place for clearing the debris basins, and if it's likely that that will happen by the storm that's expected on the 24th. I have not heard a timeline. I know they're working ur urgently and trying to clear as much debris as possible before the next predicted rain that the chief mentioned. It's kind of towards the end of next week. Um, and, you know, it's so tough with the weather, you don't know how severe uh, that's going to be. But I think they're assuming that they need to get as much work done as possible before the next storm. So they're using this window of clear weather um, to try, try to get that done. Yeah, I was wondering if the Cox representative is still here that could answer whether or not Cox will be setting up some hot spots throughout town for those of us who don't have any internet access. Thank you. Um, yes, we are looking into that. It's just taking um, some logistical details that we need to get it up here. We are um, updating the post the uh, kiosks on the city. I know Terry has been helping with that while I myself operate out of Goleta. Um, and in addition on our website, though I know some of you don't have internet, um, we do encourage, you know, on at coffee shops and so forth. So wherever you can get connection until we can figure out a hotspot. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation today. I live on Toro Canyon, and I'm a little confused as to whether I come under Summerland or under Carpinteria. I live actually right on Toro Canyon Creek. So can you advise me as to what I should be looking at, either Summerland evacuation or Carpinteria evacuation? Thank you. So uh, the Sheriff's Office services uh, both CARP and the unincorporated area. So uh, we'd be responsible for evacuations in the entire area. So once, if an emergency is happening there, we'd be the ones uh, working with Office of Emergency Management to put up those notices. So it's sort of, it's one department, so uh, um, we'll be able to recognize what areas. You're right in the border. I, I, I want to say that you're in Carpinteria 2, I believe. So you're still considered Carpinteria because you're getting into that west side. Um, but like I said, it, the Sheriff's Office is responsible for all those areas. So if we need to evacuate you, we'll knock on your door. Okay, I've got a question right back here and then I'll come up. Hi, I was just wondering if uh, Public Works has everything they need, all the assets, all the people, is there anybody with any uh, that can, if you can use some help, if there's, uh, you have all the assets you need to, to uh, secure the area? Um, right now, it, uh, we seem to be doing very well with our own forces and we have hired on an emergency <laughs> basis uh, several contractors. Um, uh, once the city council moved us into uh, an emergency situation, emergency was declared by our city council, 
we were able to go into a different mode of public contracting and we were able to contract with uh, companies such as uh, Mac Brown Construction that's doing the uh, creek clearing at, at, uh, at, at Carpentry Avenue Bridge over Carp Creek. So I think at this stage, I'm, I'm feeling confident that we have an, enough of our own forces, um, but certainly uh, anybody that wants to give me their uh, contact information and has services that they would like to or could provide us, that would be great. Uh, one of the areas, actually, I could say that we got a little extended with was traffic control. Uh, the city carpentry is a uh, public works department uh, assisted with Caltrans and the, and the CHP in doing the closures for 101. Uh, we used up a lot of our resources uh, for traffic control and uh, and then we were actually notified the emergency operations center that uh, we would no longer be able to help uh, Caltrans and uh, and uh, uh, and the CHP closing the additional um, parts of 101 because we wanted to keep enough supplies for ourselves so that was one area where I felt like um, uh, we got to the kind of the end of our resources, but as the freeway opens up, uh, we'll be retrieving our traffic control materials, and uh, I think we'll be in good shape again. Okay, we got a question right here. Hello. Thank you so much for the detailed information that you've provided. I, I find it both helpful and reassuring that you're doing such a good job. My question is about uh, preparedness for the coming rains. It sounds that like each of us in our individual locations, um, we all need to be aware of our individual circumstances as well as the community at large. I'm very hopeful about the predictive models you're discussing and I'm wondering how you're going to communicate to us well ahead of the warnings or mandatory evacuation notices? Because I think a lot of us will need to make decisions before rains start. Um, we're very confident of, of what we've seen already on the, on the analyst and the predictive side uh, of the modeling on computer modeling. Uh, that helped us even with the current uh, storm that we went through. Uh, it was predicted to the point of uh, timing, when the rain was going to happen, and how much, and was spot on. So knowing that, and coming and moving forward with our contingency plan, uh, we are trying to get the modeling so that you as a public can go onto a website, and we're trying to work that through either Office of Emergency Management, if that's the most appropriate, for the county area at large, and then you can go and interact with that, listening to the weather report, and putting in the amount of information uh, that it will ask you to go through. So it'll be very interactive, and then specifically look at that map and see how that affects you in your local area. And so that's what we're drilling towards. Okay. So we should keep track of Office of Emergency Management website? Yes, I think Office of Emergency Management website, because they're the global uh, notification, is what we use both the sheriff and the fire department uh, to feed information to them and they're the messaging center under a joint information center uh, so that we have one message and it's not being complicated and, and we work in coordination with the city's office of, uh, 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 emergency office uh, center and as well as their, their information. So we're all saying the same message. Uh, yeah, just to add a, a little bit um, to that, uh, you know, we started planning for this, uh, for floods when the fire was still going. I mean, as fires were still in the front country, we were already meeting um, uh, about floods because we knew that there was going to be a huge concern because it wasn't even winter time or it was, it was that very short week, a week or two, and then we were going to thought we'd hit rain. And so, I mean, during that time, we were still having daily meetings with uh, um, Office of Emergency Management was bringing all the cities in the county and we were having uh, daily conference calls and we were starting to set up stuff. So we've done a lot of pre-planning and no, no entities by themselves. We've all been doing this together. And uh, the, the County of Santa Barbara, I mean, that's their responsibility is to put out as much information. We try to do it jointly. So we try to have the same message and then we try to get that message out. Thank you all. Um, I'm, I live, between 6th Street and the campgrounds and right next door to the 
water, the sewage treatment plant. And I just heard that the wall, that concrete wall, um, is cracked and some of it's fallen into the creek. I think that's what I heard. Um, and I can take home information to about 40 people tonight. Um, and I don't want to overreact, but I, you know, and I know we don't have crystal balls, but so that gives me more concern given that the two areas that we're sandwiched between were flooded and the sewage treatment plant seemed to be protected a little bit by that concrete wall. I heard that, you know, an engineer would need to come out, exert, you know, that maybe that repair won't happen for a long time. That's what I'm thinking. And also just, um, sorry to ask this, and maybe you're not the ones, you can tell me. If we sandbag, we, lots of us have glass doors on that first level. And if the creek, came, if it, you know, if water came up, like it did on 6th Street, for example, do sandbags, are, do they help? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I can definitely answer the first part of that. Um, once again, this is the photo of the sanitary district's property in their wall um, that pr protects the uh, sanitary district's uh, treatment facilities. Uh, the wall did crack um, about midway up um, uh, through this area, and a lot of it subsided, and you can see it kind of sort of disjointed the front of the wall, and actually that part of the wall was literally at a 45 degree angle. Now it almost looks like a, a horizontal shelf, but uh, that's not the way it was constructed. Um, I think uh, for the 6th Street area, this is downstream. Um, I think that the sanitary district will be looking at this wall area and what they may do in the near term to uh, protect their facilities. But since this is downstream of 6th Street, I see this as uh, a significantly less risk um, associated with 6th Street itself. Um, and then uh, for 6th Street, I think the bigger issue is that we need to get the storm drain system uh, cleaned out and functioning, uh, get the mud off the road. And we're doing that part of the work as fast as possible uh, with contractors, another set of contractors coming in early next week with uh, vacuum trucks, that kind of thing, to see if we can get down into that storm drain system and get it cleared. So I, I think this being downstream uh, is, is less of a risk uh, for 6th Street. Um, and 6th Street itself, we need to pay attention to those storm drain systems and get them going. All right, let's have a couple more questions and then we'll move to close. Michael? I would like to thank Pizza Man Dance for letting everybody come in this week to watch the 4 o'clock news conference and the news in the afternoon so we can keep updated on what is happening. I'd also like to say thank you to McDonald's for letting people come in and use their Wi-Fi because they never went down this week. And Cox was down for most of the week. Do they have a plan for the rest of the winter to, to maybe keep from not going out again? And the Olympic Games are next month, and I really don't want to lose my Olympic Games coverage. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. I'll turn it back to Carla. I completely understand. My team is still in the playoffs, so I'm very excited. But um, that being said, we are looking at alternate routes for things. Um, this has never happened, and usually our system works on a redundancy, so there's two lines. And it just so happened that it hit both of them. So we are looking at alternate routes. As, as we mentioned, we were very creative in establishing a temporary line to get what we have powered up, up and running. Um, long term, absolutely, our planning teams and um, network teams are looking at that. It's just going to be longer because we, st we still are on search and recovery, and we do have to follow a chain of command, not just for safety reasons, but just to make sure that it's um, consistent and a long-term plan. So more soon, I, I anticipate we'll continue to share more information as we learn more about the incident. Thank you. Hi. Um, early on with the first incident, there was a map issued that showed all of Carpinteria flooded. Was that a mistake, or this doesn't look like all of Carpinteria is flooded? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the map that was put on, uh, put out early, identified what, what was, were being termed risk areas. Um, so it wasn't suggesting that all of Carpinteria would be flooded, just that those were areas of risk of flooding. 
Different than the hazard maps that Charlie was talking about, they took a very broad look at potential flooding hazard. As, we, as we've talked about today, with the three watersheds that come down and the confluence of three creeks coming through the city of Carpinteria and the overlapping risks uh, that were identified, virtually the whole town of Carpinteria ended up being in that light blue shaded area that we all, all remember seeing. The likelihood of all those flooding at once, of course, would be astronomical, but any one watershed receiving a lot of rain and having uh, flooding uh, is much more likely. So I think, um, you know, that, does that clarify for you kind of how that works? Uh, there are all some risk, but each watershed getting the 50-year, 100-year, 200-year, uh, each has their own odds of getting a cell that might park over that area and create problems. All right, I did promise uh, that the, the speaker in blue would have a chance to read Mr. Williams' statement, so one let's, last question, one last question, then we'll go there. Thank you, Pretty, perfect. I think there's an elephant in the room. Um, thank you so much for, I know this is a lot of work putting all this together, and we appreciate it. We've gotten so much information, but I think in the back of everyone's mind is, could what happened in Montecito happen here? And so I just wonder if the officials and some of the reasoning, and I don't want to create panic or anything, but, um, I think we just want to know is that, and I, again, you don't have a crystal ball, as someone said, but obviously there was a lot of thought into doing this. So my question is, could what happened in Montecito happen here? That's an excellent question and one that uh, we want to be able to answer, uh, as I said, with the WIRT uh, information, the Watershed Emergency Response Team. And uh, they're scientific. It's very scientific of what they're doing. And we can answer that question uh, with this modeling. What they have told us, the burn that has happened in the Thomas Fire has denuded the entire mountain range, 19 miles from Ventura through Santa Barbara County. So it's not just Carpinteria. We have past the Ventura, Ojai. The city of Ojai is not out of the woods yet. So we're concerned with everybody. And so we want to make sure that we're very precise about how we um, look at that in the future. And with the Here's the key, weather is unpredictable. We know that. Even they're saying we could receive this much rainfall as we saw in Montecito, and it could happen in our hills here. If a cell decides to stall and drop its water, uh, that's where we have that unpredictable part of how much is too much. And, and uh, I appreciate, yes, we don't have the crystal ball, but I can say this, with the type of weathering and the um, information we'll have, we will be ahead of it, and our goal will be at least 12 to 18 hours ahead of information that we can come together, as we said, with Sheriff, Office of Emergency Management, Emergency Response, the cities, anyone who's affected in these areas where this rain may be coming, to give a warning or information, here's your best case. And it, there may be situations where if you're on high ground, we would want you to stay just because uh, it, you may weather it better than everybody leaving. It's, it's going to be imaginable with, with the unpredictability of weather. So uh, good question. And know this, that, that we have your back if you trust us to give you the right information in a timely manner and you follow it and you're prepared now. The key message here, be prepared now. If you don't have enough water on hand today, go get it. Get your flashlights. Get your documents together because we just don't know. We have until May for our rain season to go past. And uh, just I think if we could end with this note here, uh, we were preparing for the El Nino. And I remember we put generators and such and thinking we're going to get the rainfall of all rainfall. Then we went 200 plus days with no rain. <laughs> I just want you to remember that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me, if I could put this in context so it makes sense. Um, I had uh, texted and, and written to Supervisor Williams about putting the soil on a designated spot that had you know, asphalt and was solid instead of putting it on the beach. And his response was, and I told him I was here today, he said, I'd like to be there, but I'm hope, hopping on the last train to Santa Barbara before the vigil I, plan I had helped plan. If the city of Carpinteria has another site they want County Public Works to use for material that is in the city of Carp, I can get them to use another site. They do, I, I had also suggested to them that they could use the powers of eminent domain if they needed to use private parking lots. 
that they do not have time before the next storm to go through the eminent domain process. The county is in, is in a case in this case only trying to be a good partner and prevent funding in the city of Carpinteria. But if the city wants the county to do something else, please have Dave Duffelfinger, city manager, let me know. So it seemed to me that it would make more sense to utilize some parking lots within the city um, to control this instead of putting it on the public beach and the waters of the um, international waters and waters of the United States. Off the top of my head, Again, I don't know all of the parking lots in Carpinteria, but there are a number, the Venico site. Um, obviously, I think City Hall, you could use maybe a portion of it, but you need most of it. Um, you've got the Viola ball fields. Um, I'm sure there's other parking lots that are not necessarily in commercial centers, because I think people want to be able to get to the retail centers that could be used. I don't know if you could use the State Beach because of that. Actually, they haven't, okay. and that's the thank problem. You. Okay, so, thank you. Anyway, thank you I don't want to get into appreciate arguments. The comment. Yeah. So that's thank you. I, I do want to just say in response to that before I, uh, we invite uh, Council Member Clark up for closing comments that um, uh, there, the, some of the material is being segregated. Some of it is going down south to a parking lot at the Ventura Fairgrounds. You, you may have seen uh, some pictures with tanker trucks. So uh, when uh, Caltrans was... Uh, uh, vacuuming essentially uh, uh, material out of a freeway area into tanker trucks. Those are being uh, taken, that material is being taken to a different location with enclosed, enclosed tanker. So I do want to assure you that uh, based on where the material is coming from, there is some segregation on where it's being dumped uh, and how it's uh, treated. Also, I also I want to assure you that um, there is a monitor always on site at Ash Avenue and at the Goleta Beach. Uh, who has uh, environmental uh, credentials and watches the material. They have a team standing by, and if there's anything there that looks suspicious, oily material, that sort of thing, they can stop the job and they can conduct a cleanup right there on the spot. So these are some of the assurances that have been put in place to try to mitigate the concerns that we've heard about. So thank you very much. I'm going to invite Council Member Clark up. If we could go to the end of the, uh, the slide there, uh, we're going to uh, uh, hear some closing remarks from Councilmember Clark and then have a moment of silence for the 20 folks that have been lost in this disaster. Thank you, Dave, and thanks for everybody for coming out this afternoon and, and giving us all your questions and feedback. Um, I want to um, not take a lot of time because we've listened to a lot of people, heard a lot of stuff, but if you just give me a moment, um, I want to talk for a moment about us. Um, I think everybody will acknowledge that we have been through a lot. Um, you know, from the, from the beginning of the Thomas fire and, um, you know, it's down there in Ventura, it's down there and pretty soon it jumps to 33 and oh, well, they'll take care of it. And, uh, then that evening it goes down and jumps the 101 and, um, you get a sense that anything is possible. And then it came over here and, um, Basically, we've been in a disaster movie that, that didn't end in an hour and 53 minutes, and it's, it's ongoing, and we've been here tonight. It may go into the future. Um, I think it's, uh, for me, uh, seeing those flames dance, dance down the hill on Sunday morning will never go away for me. Um, it's something we, that we've never been through this before. Um, hopefully, we'll, after this is over, we'll never go through it again. But it's, it's been horrific. It's been terrifying and very stressful. Um, and we've, we've we suffered a lot of terror and fear during the fire, but we've got lingering concerns with the, with the flooding. And it's, it's just as serious, perhaps more serious, obviously. Um, so um, with the, with the um, flooding and with the fire, you know, we, we've been through all this stuff, we've been through all this trauma, and um, we've got our, our hills are denuded, um, and we've got mud and crap all over the place, and the creeks are full, and we can't communicate, and we can't go down the road. Um, and so it's, it's been horrible. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that um, uh, Carpentry, I think, has three strengths um, to make it a successful small town. Number one, we have a beautiful environment. Well, it's not beautiful right now. <laughs> uh, 
but it will be. It'll come back. The, the uh, hills will get green again. The mud will be taken away, and uh, the logs will get out of the creek, and you know, it'll be a sunny day, and, and, and we'll go forward. And they'll, they'll, they'll open the roads, and, and things will get back to normal. But we're still in the process. It's, it's not over yet. And um, the, the other strength that we have that, uh, that, that was referred to is, is our local downtown businesses. And, and they're really an important part of what makes the town successful. And uh, so it is important that we get, that we get people shopping locally. Um, and, and lastly, the, the one, probably the most important thing is the people. Um, we're, we're a close-knit community. Even before this happened, everybody, everybody, we have a high rate of volunteerism of Cart and Maria. Everybody helps each other out. Many, many different service organizations. A lot of people help three, four different organizations, help different segments of the population. So we do, we do take care of each other. And uh, I think if we, if we think positively, we, we work together, we work as a community, and, and we cooperate with each other, then, then, then we can get this done and we can get through to the end. Um, and uh, sp speaking of, of all the mud and silt, I mean, you should see the salt marsh. And there's like six feet of mud in there, and it's full to capacity. And um, if, we get, if we get floodwaters without clearing that out, you know, we risk flooding residences upstream, over on Ash, um, and down on Sandy Land, even on the ocean side of Sandy Land. And um, so I think that we need to uh, just, just uh, understand that safety is, is our most basic human priority, as we've heard from, the, from, the, from everybody up there, especially the fire chief. Safe, safety is our, our basic priority. We've got to have safety before we can uh, satisfy other needs, even health, even hunger, um, and, and going on up the hierarchy to art and philosophy and such. So um, please, just everybody, let's, let's, let's work together, together to make sure that we are all safe and, and we can get through this to the end. Thank you. Let's just take a moment to remember those lost in this disaster. Thank you, Carpinteria.